Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're so glad that you've decided to share a part of your day with us. We are studying the series we have called the Sabbath School Lessons, and it's a series on Galatians. Uh, and we're ready for lesson number 10, entitled The Two Covenants. And before we begin, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us for a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the many promises that you have made to us in Scripture. We thank you for the opportunity to be your children. We ask that you will guide and direct that we may not make the mistakes that some have made in Scripture times, but that we may come close to you, that we may behave like your real children and become more like you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson deals with the ideas of covenant. Covenants are just agreements or uh, in the scriptural terms they're more like promises that one side or the other side makes in order to seal an agreement between two people or two groups of people. In this case we're primarily talking about agreements or promises between God and his covenant people, the children of Israel, in Old Testament times. There are actually three covenants, major covenants in the Old Testament. Uh, we usually talk about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and we'll try to explain why that is a little bit later. But um, let's just look at some of those covenants. The first one is found in Genesis uh, 12, verses 1 to 3, and it's repeated several times, but let me just read these verses. The Lord said to Abram, now this is beginning the story of Abram in, in uh, the book of Genesis, leave your country, your relatives and your father's home, and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants. They will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you, and through you I will bless all the nations." Now if you stop and think about it, that's a pretty incredible promise that God made to Abram. And of course we know that historically Abram took off as God had instructed, went to Haran, and then later moved on from Haran down to the land of Canaan. The covenant which followed, the next covenant, was a covenant made with the children of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai, and that one is repeated three times actually in Exodus 19.8. I'll read you the first occurrence. Now if you remember much about the Bible, if you remember the story of Exodus, this is what happened just before God came down on Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments and a bunch of other things which he had to say to the children of Israel. And in verse 8 it says, Then all the people answered, and maybe I guess we should really start um, with verse 7, So Moses went down and called the leaders of the people together and told them, that every, told them everything that the Lord had commanded him. So now they've just gotten all the instructions from God. Then all the people answered together, We will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. Now I guess what I should ask you, did Moses need to report this to the Lord, or did the Lord already know what they had promised? <laughs> That's a pretty simple question. God already knew very clearly what they had promised, didn't he? Well, God said, okay, I'm not going to leave it at that. This is, this is a serious business. We, we better go back and repeat it. So four chapters later, we come to Exodus 24 and verse 3. And the people have heard everything. Moses has come down from the mountain. They've, they, they've been the whole, through the whole Sinai experience, and they saw God come down on the mountain. They saw the mountain shake and the black clouds and the, the thunder and the lightning and all that. And so Moses comes down the mountain, and he tells them what God has told them that he wants them to do. And their response in tw Exodus 24, verse 3 is, We will do everything that the Lord has said. And so Moses said, Well, okay, that's good. He wrote everything down, um, wrote all the Lord's commands down. Early the next morning he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve stones, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel and so forth. And if you drop down to verse 7, then he took the book of the covenant which he had written out, and in which the Lord's commands were written, and read it aloud to the people. Now this is how many times that they heard this? They heard, the third time. This will be the third time they've now gotten these instructions. And what did they say? 
we will obey the Lord and do everything that he has commanded. And that's exactly what they did, right? Now, this is in pretty close association to the mountain rocking and uh, shaking and the fire, mm -hmm. nose in the ground. Mm -hmm. What would you expect them to say? <clears throat> we will do everything that the Lord has said. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they, even, they said that even before the mountain shook and before the yeah. black cloud and before any of that. They said that they promised even before those, that experience. They probably so, meant it. They probably thought they would. It's sort of like a robber holding a gun at you and you'll say, I'll do anything. Which reminds me of a story of a friend of mine who uh, one time was a pastor in uh, a church over in Arizona. And uh, he actually... I knew the pastor, and I also knew the guy who reported. Anyway, he, uh, this pastor, about midnight, had someone knock on his door. He went to the door, and here was a young man. And as soon as he opened the door, the guy stuck a gun in his face and marched him back into the house. And he says, call your wife and your children. I want them to stand at the wall, or by the wall, right over there. So he got his kids up, his wife and his kids up, and they were standing along the wall outside. And the guy says, well, he says, he put his gun down. He, he held it in his hand so he could put it up in it, but he was holding it down. He says, now he says, I want to ask you some questions. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the Bible? And a whole bunch of questions like that, you know, things that you would expect a Christian to answer. And the guy said, after he'd done about 10 questions or something, he said, okay, now we're going to find out what you really believe. So he said, he picked the gun up now and held it right up to his temple like this. He says, now I'm going to ask you exactly the same questions and the first time you say yes, I'm going to pull the trigger. And what would you say? Oh. Held it up to his own head? No, he held it up to the pastor's head. Oh. Wow. He held it up to the pastor's head as soon as you, as you say and so he said, do you believe in God? And the pastor had already decided, he said, you know, if, if, I'm, if he's going to shoot me, I'm not going to go out lying. I mean, I'm going to tell the truth. Do you believe, he said, do you believe in God? And he said, yes. And the young man just took his gun and threw it across the room. He says, I didn't think there was anyone left in the world who really, really believed anything. Oh. And then a lot of things happened after that. And, uh, I wish I had time to tell you the whole story, but wow. that was that part of the story. So, do you think it's really fantastic that they they said yes, they would do everything the Lord would say? Well, the part that's the part that's a little scary is what happened about six weeks later. <laughs> well, yeah, but um, isn't that just kind of part of the education that you go through? Don't you have to know yourself? I mean, I found out that I did a lot of things that I didn't think I'd ever do, mm -hmm. and I was really surprised. Mm -hmm. and, um, and So this is an ex exercise on the part of God to show them that they couldn't do it themselves? Is that what you're saying? Well, just to, to know themselves a little better. I, there's a lot of people that don't know themselves very well. Yeah, on the well, they, you know, and um, that, that's part of the process everybody goes through. Is, mm -hmm. Don't they kind of learn about themselves yeah. through, through life? Well, what, why, why? what would have been the educated answer? What would have been the educated answer? Yeah. Oh, we'll never be able to handle all that. With you <laughs> helping us, we can. Yeah. With you helping us, we can. They, they didn't grab onto God. Yeah, that would, be, that would be right. I, yeah, probably. Well, d when, they, when they spoke this, were they speaking ignorantly or they were naive? I, I think they were naive. And if they were naive, then certainly their intents were best. And so why didn't God say, well, you've spoke a little hastily here. You That's know, why this, you repeated it three times. This is the, this is the real situation here. And, uh, you know, why don't you, maybe you need to rethink this or maybe I ought to help you or something like that. Why did he just, it's like, Seemed like he could well, have been a little more help here. God, God kept working with them. He kind of reminds me of Peter. Well, oh, I will stand up with you no matter what happens. Yeah. He kept he kept working with them, but they didn't get any better no. because they couldn't get any no. better. Is what we would say today. Well, so what? What? You know what? Uh, well, why didn't he just tell them? You know, you really can't do this. This is what I want you to learn. Why do we? have to go through. Okay, what, what big 
very significant difference did you see between the first covenant we read, the one he made with Abram, and this covenant? What was the big difference? Abraham. I didn't hear Abram say anything. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have even known he was in on the covenant if he hadn't got up and gone. Mm -hmm. So who did all the promising? Well, God did all the promising. But God made some statements. He says, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Abraham yeah. going to say, oh, no, you won't. So why didn't he, why no. didn't, why didn't he come down here and say the, say the same thing? Yeah, it, well, but, but in was the Moses, same. Was Moses supposed to bring, you know, when he brought all this stuff down here, was Moses supposed, to f Moses supposed to follow this up with something? And Well, by the way, you're not going to be able to do this? Or Well, the important point is that that coming at the foot of Mount Sinai, who did all the promising? Well, the, the, people, the people did. The people did all the promising, and that was the difference. That's the big difference. And it's interesting, if you go over to the third giving of a major covenant, which is found in Jeremiah 31, starting with verse 31, look at that, Jeremiah 31, 31. The Lord says, now tell me, is this more like the first covenant, the, the Abram covenant, or is it like the Sinai covenant? The time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors. Now you can see why some is called, some is called the old and the other one is called the new. When I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be like this, will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. So if a covenant is agreement between, let's say, two or more parties, then where is it that, the, the, that Abraham entered into the first covenant and where is it that these people entered into the third covenant. There's yeah. no response. No. So well, how do did we... God, and, and the same would be true of the middle covenant. Did, did, uh, God had given some instructions, but he wasn't there apparently at the... I mean, it wasn't apparent there at the time it was given. The people just said, oh yes, whatever God has said, we'll do it. Well, of course, but, they were kind of shivering down there. But even in that... <laughs> scene up on that mountain. Even in that covenant with Abraham... Uh, it wasn't all God. I mean, he said, I will do the promising, and I will do this and do that, but you have to get up and go. Yeah. And Abraham did. And Abraham went. Mm -hmm. uh, so in this, in this covenant, what was the two-way street? The third one or the second one? Either one. Well, again, God gave instructions. The people promised. That was the second covenant, yeah. if you will. The third covenant we're going to read about in just a minute. He, God says he will do these things. And the question is, did they do it? Or, and, and we know that the, the people of Israel ultimately did not because they, you know, they finally ended up crucifying Christ. Well, what, well, but I mean, how did Abraham fulfill his covenant anymore? Did he have well, he, he had some glitches, but he, he followed God pretty closely. What about the... Um, he, he didn't get involved in syncretism. Well, but wasn't the covenant, uh, doesn't Paul strongly intimate <laughs> that, um, you know, we're, we today are, are heirs to this promise. Mm -hmm. So, where am I going with that? Um, <laughs> where, where, well, you know, look, how, how, I mean, if, if, if Israel didn't fulfill uh, the, the second covenant or the third covenant or whatever it was, how is it they fulfilled part of the first one anyway? Because they're related to Abraham. Yeah. Wasn't his the problem. It wasn't listen, just to Abraham. Listen to everybody. these words. Christians who reject the authority of the Old Testament often see the giving of the law in Sinai as being inconsistent with the gospel. <coughs> they conclude that the covenant given on Sinai represents an era, a dispensation, from a time in human history when salvation was based on obedience to the law. But because the people failed to live up to the demands of the law, God, they say, ushered in a new covenant, a covenant of grace through the merits of Jesus Christ. This, then, is their understanding of the two covenants, the old based on law and the new based on grace. Is that the way things worked? Well, you know, in the Ten Commandments, I think 
it was just the perspective. God was giving ten promises. You will not. You will, um, you will enjoy the Sabbath. You will not commit adultery. You will not lie. You will not steal. I promise that if you're my people, this is the kind of people you're going to become. Mm -hmm. And they should have said, thank you. This is the kind of people that we would like to be, but we can't be that on our own. Mm -hmm. So those are ten promises, What God, the kind of person God is going to make you to be, so then that you fit into heaven. What about the, um, what was the, uh, the, the event where God had, was it Abraham, divide, you know, get a bull, cut it in half, and yeah. where, yeah. where God walked through the halves? We're going to talk about that later. But, okay, but Abraham didn't have to go through. Yeah, he it did. They did both he go went, through? Yeah. And, and the cutting of the, end, well, hold on that, because we're going to okay. talk a little bit more about that. Right. So hold on that question for a little bit. Our Christian friends usually see these two covenants as the representations of how God is related to his people in two different time periods. But the essential difference between the two covenants is the relationship between the two covenanting parties rather than the time period. And again, let us emphasize the differences in the first and the third covenant. Who's doing the promising? God is. God. In the middle covenant, the one at foot of Mount Sinai, who was doing the promising? They were. The people were. Also in the first and the third covenant, wasn't God talking to more friends? Abraham was God's friend. And he was, in the third covenant, God was saying, I'm going to make you this way. You're going to be my friend. Well, and we're in the middle one. Mm -hmm. He was talking to former slaves who had no concept of how to be a friend with God. Yeah, well, that's largely true. Although the third covenant was actually given to at a time when pretty, vir virtually all the children of Israel had already been taken off into Babylonian captivity. So it and wasn't who like... who was it given to? <coughs> it was given to Jeremiah, who was still back in Jerusalem. And he was given to a prophet then? Jeremiah, Jeremiah was, was a prophet. A and a priest. And was Jeremiah supposed to uh, talk about that yes. to the other people? He was finally instructed to... Well, actually, his secretary was instructed to stand up at the entrance to the temple and read all these things to the people. Yeah. Well, back in the very beginning, Cain represented a kind of old or first covenant relationship with God. He wanted to please God by doing what? Things his way. Mm -hmm. Doing things his way. Something he could do himself. Do himself. It was a kind of do-it-yourself religion. He wanted to offer uh, his fruits and vegetables, what he grew, <laughs> instead of killing a, uh, a sheep, lamb. a lamb. Yeah. By contrast, Abel trusted God and had a new covenant relationship, following God's instructions and trusting God and God's grace for their relationship. Cain's approach which was a selfish one. I can do it myself the way I choose. Abraham's approach, I'm sorry, Abel's approach was a trusting one. He chose to do things God's way. Now Cain wanted to do his worship service his way. And Abel says, I'm going to do it the way God told me to do it, exactly. even though it's distasteful to me. Yes, exactly. Did, did, is there anything in the Bible that ta tells you that he, God told him to, to do it his way, to yeah. do it Abel's way? Well, I mean to do it God's way. He told Abel to do it God's yeah, way? Yeah, to do it. What, what in the Bible gives you an indication that it was God's way other than he just... He, he liked Abel's, um, Abel's offering better. Mm -hmm. He said that was Abel it? obeyed. He, he says, well, Abel obeyed, I think. Something what was that? that? I think he said that Abel obeyed his, what he asked. And oh, that he came. obeyed afterwards? Or he said something That's to that. Well, right. God had instructed Adam and Eve to kill a lamb. So maybe well, that. What I don't understand is that Abel, was a sheep herder. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a sheep herder. Uh, Cain was a farmer. Mm -hmm. So it seems like they just brought their own goods. Yeah. Um, well, to a certain extent, yes. Well, um, that's a good point. So, how would you know that? Um, wh how would how would Cain know well, where to get and, and the, the answer, other of stuff. course, is that it was it was based on instructions that God had given to them, which we don't have recorded. 
Well, so you assume it, that just yeah. because just because God said that yeah. He liked this offering better than this one. Yes. But was it because of the offering or because of the state of mind between the two? Well, I I, I think the state of the mind is what led to the uh, the offering. Okay. I mean, I because it was it wasn't between, just a lamb. It was no. it was a it was fat too that He brought. It was mm -hmm. just. It was it was a produce type of thing also. So So let's let's read our, our passage for today. And it starts in Galatians chapter four. We're gonna begin with verse twenty one. Paul says, Let me ask those of you who want to be subject to the law, do you not hear what the law says? It says that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. His, name by, his son by the slave woman was born in the usual way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of God's promise. You know, what, just quickly, what does Paul mean by subject to the law here? Those of you want to be subject to the law, what mm -hmm. does he mean by that? Well, again, I, I, would, I, I think you better hold that question okay. for just a moment because we're going to run across another expression under the law, and we're going to find out What's the relationship between subject to the law, which under the law, and so forth, okay? These things can be understood as a figure. The two women represent two covenants. Now we see how we get to the covenant business. The one whose children are born in slavery is Hagar, and she represents the covenant made at Mount Sinai. So again, what was the, what was the basis of the covenant made in Mount Sinai? What do we say about it? We'll do it ourselves. Anything you tell us, God, we'll just, we can do it ourselves. We, it's a do-it-yourself religion. Was the, was the relationship between Abraham and Hagar a do-it-yourself program? Yes. <coughs> yes, Grandma but was. Was. when yeah. Abraham's wife didn't get pregnant, he took on her servant mm -hmm. uh, gal. Now, now, why did he do that? Sarah asked him to. Mm. Okay, and why, did, why do you think she asked him to? God she was helping out God. Because sure. God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yes. God was no. not coming through for her, so yeah. she thought this might be. Speed it up. With our modern ways of thinking, it seems like a strange arrangement. But in ancient times, it was so important, especially for someone who was a landholder or someone who was wealthy, to have, to have an heir, yes. that this was one of the acceptable ways that you could get an heir for you. And, you know, you, there are quite a number of concubines in, in Old Testament history. Um, it, Abraham had an uncle who was a But it concubine. was not according to the promise. No, it was not according to promise. No. But Abraham, I mean, now, let's just be let's honest. Let's help the promise out a little bit. Yeah. Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees when he was 75. His wife was 65. Now, we don't know exactly how long she kept having periods in those days. But she, he, they go and they finally get to the land of Canaan. Abraham is now ten, is 10 years later. Abraham is now 85. And sometime about that point, Sarah stopped having periods. Now, if you know anything about the way those things work, <laughs> what are the chances that she's going to get pregnant? Not very good. <laughs> Essentially zero. Essentially zero. So God, I mean, so Abraham and Sarah said, okay, Maybe God needs a little help here, right? Well, maybe they were thinking, you know, maybe we're supposed to be doing something here. There was that process theology on their part. Mm -hmm. Does God like to keep you hanging on beyond where you think God should act? How do you, because how do you, it seems like that's it. Does a, seem that's, like you do that? It does that. Often. He does that. A, he waits in, until you just completely run out of patience, and you think, mm -hmm. well, maybe I've got to do something. It, it, it's interesting. And you look through the stories of the women in the Bible, the women that have had promise, women that were part of uh, the line of Christ. They were all barren. Mm -hmm. and Almost last every last one of them. Well, Jacob had four <laughs> wives that were too barren. Well, Hannah, uh, you know, there, you, you can go down the list and, and they just one Sarah, right at Rebecca. Rebecca and, yeah, and yeah. They, were all, they were all barren. Hmm? Oh, had Rahab. to have some help because yeah. his wives didn't always do what yeah. they were Rahab supposed. wasn't barren. No. <laughs> well, coming back, although she was barren by her, well, you said Rahab? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hagar, who stands for Mount Sinai and Rabia, we're going back to Galatians 4, is a figure of the present city of Jerusalem. 
Now, think about what's going on in our, if you remember our story of, of Galatians here, Paul is competing against who? The Judaizers. The Judaizers. And they would say that, you know, the very best thing that we can offer is the covenant that God made with the children of Israel and the capital city of our nation <laughs> is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the high point, right? It's where the temple sounds. It, it is the center of activity, right? Paul says, Hagar, the slave woman, is a figure of the present city of Jerusalem. Do you think they're very comfortable hearing that? In slavery with all its people. Now, now is, is, he's pointing out this comparison. Now, is this a comparison that he's kind of uh, uh, creatively uh, using as an illustration, or is this the way that God in, always intended it to be? Kind of like a prophecy. Type. Well, the text has two Jerusalems. Yeah, I'm getting ready to read the other is, one. Yeah. Now, this is the Jerusalem they built themselves with their own hands. Right. Like uh, Abraham and Hagar took it into their own hands to, yeah. to create a son. And, and God creates nature and, and the forest and all that. And uh, so he brought around a son in the way he does his creation. I don't know. It, yeah. So well, Jerusalem was built with their own hands. Okay. You know, we're, we're critical of people who pray for something and then just stand back and wait for God to do something. Yeah. You know, so h how does it well, work? Well, Gary already said God helps those who help themselves. How, how does it work? If God comes down and makes a promise, then you just sit around and wait. But if you pray for something, well, you've got to get out and work. Now, what, <laughs> how does this work? Well, let me read the rest of the passage. Mm-hmm. But the heavenly Jerusalem, Norm, there's your second Jerusalem, mm -hmm. is free, and she is our mother. So Paul is making a very, very unfriendly comparison between the current Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem. For the scripture says, Be happy, you childless woman. Shout and cry with joy, you, have, you who, have, who never have felt the pains of childbirth. For the woman who is deserted will have more children than the woman whose husband never left her. Very interesting passage from the Old Testament. More are the children of the barren. Mm -hmm. it, um, it says, my Bible says, the Jerusalem above is free, and it says heaven. So he's talking about heaven. Yeah. But that completely doesn't make sense. Why is the barren woman, uh, why are the children of the barren woman more numerous well, I, this doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> look, look at the history. What happened? Of Jerusalem, which oh. became the, which became the the larger group of the, the larger number of descendants, the larger group of people, the descendants of Hagar Isaac, or the descendants of Ishmael. Oh, okay, okay. We usually usually consider the descendants of Ishmael as uh, Arab, Muslim. That, that well, kind of thing. they they mixed with a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. Can't even trace the descendants of Ishmael anymore. Also, but they're mixed. They're, they're Muslims. And there's they the, would be today probably. The spiritual Jews too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, now you, my brothers and sisters, are God's children, as a result of His promise, just as Isaac was. Now, clearly, Isaac was not born because Abraham and Sarah, you know, used the right techniques or did something different. You know, obviously. This child was a child of the promise. It's a miraculous baby, right? At that time, the son who was born in the usual way persecuted the one who was born because of God's Spirit, and it is the same now. But what does the Scripture say? It says, send the slave woman and her son away, for the son of the slave woman will not have a part in the father's property along with the son of the free woman. So then, my brothers and sisters, we are not the children of a slave woman, but of a free woman. And if you want to be, he could have gone on to say, if you want to be a child of the slave woman, what are we going to do with you? Cast you out. Away with you, right? Spit you out. And what makes you the slave? You want to do it yourself. You don't need any help. So that's where the tie-in is. Well, this is a difficult passage. Some consider it to be the most difficult passage in all of Galatians. Mm -hmm. It involves people doing things which seem very strange to our modern thinking. Sarah gave Hagar to Abram as a secondary wife or concubine in order to claim Hagar's child as her own. Once again, Sarah was trying to work things out for herself. 
God and Abram, or Abraham, sealed an agreement by passing between animals that had been cut in half. Thus we have the Old Testament expression, cutting an agreement. We usually say making an agreement, but the Old Testament literally says cutting an agreement. The implication was that just as one killed animals to seal the agreement, he would be subject to death if he broke it. That was, that was the sort of understanding. We're cutting these animals in half, okay? If we don't agree, I mean, if we don't follow through on our agreement here. Pick your half. Yeah. Cut me in half, huh? Mm. So, so when God was, what did he promise when he went through the, between the two animals? He promised Abraham that he would have many descendants. Well, he also, he also. And that they would be the descendants of, of Sarah. If you really think about it, you could tie this onto the cross. Eventually. Because God mm -hmm. died on the cross, so it's almost like he failed in some way, that, that promise, mm -hmm. because it didn't happen. Yeah. It didn't happen. Abraham did have a lot of descendants. Well, why did Jesus have to die? Because I think there's a connection there somehow. Mm -hmm. Well. Let's look back even further in history. The very first agreement that God made with, had made with human beings was in the Garden of Eden. It involved several things. One, having children to spread out and occupy the earth, working during six days of the week, resting on the Sabbath, and staying away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, which of those four things would you say were the most important in terms of staying out of trouble? Uh, number four, staying number away four, from the staying, tree. And of course they didn't do it, did they? Well, while they were still in the Garden of Eden, it was natural for Adam and Eve to follow God's will in every detail of their lives. It was natural for them to be obedient. <laughs> but sin changed all of that. Natural obedience to God became impossible. In order to restore a relationship with God, God's grace entered the picture. Back and to that tree just for a sec. It was right next to the tree of life. That's right. So how do you stay away from it without going to the Well, tree the only of life? thing you have to do to stay away from it is not to eat of it. Okay. But that's a little different than staying away from it because it was in the same proximity. Well, we often talk about Genesis three fifteen that followed shortly thereafter as the first promise of the gospel, right? Let me read it to you and I want you to tell me where's the promise of the gospel in these words. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. Now, who is God speaking to? Satan. The serpent. The serpent. He was speaking to Satan through the serpent, yeah. So, are we saying that God's first gospel message was spoken to Satan? Well, you don't have to yeah, yeah, it was, <laughs> because Satan was the he was talking to Satan and saying what was going to happen in in the final so, outcome. Um, Who are you know Satan's offsprings? You, you and me. Is that <laughs> okay? So Satan's <laughs> offsprings, and then her offspring was only singular, meaning Jesus. It what, didn't well, that, have an S. That that comes later. That covenant to one and so forth kind of thing. You know, but that, the question I have is, where, where's the gospel in Genesis 3.15? Where there? Yeah. That the, the one, you want yeah, plus it's not really specifying the woman either because we've already talked there about it. There it is. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. Now where's the gospel? That is the experience of Jesus. Jesus crushed Satan's head, but Satan did some damage on Jesus. And it is singular there. Mm -hmm. Her offspring, it's not plural. Mm -hmm. So we are Satan's offsprings, and Jesus is her offspring. Well, the gospel, as we know it, says everything's going to work out all right. Mm -hmm. And that's what that says. <laughs> I see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Does crushing the serpent's head sound like the gospel? In a sense. In what <laughs> sense is war between the serpent and the woman a foretaste of the gospel? Well, I, you know, they did get into trouble, didn't they? Yes. And isn't it good news that the person that got you in trouble is going to get done in somehow? 
Well, <laughs> yeah. That seems good news to me. <laughs> and, and is the woman in this um, verse um, speaking of the church? Eventually, the woman is we think. often represents a church. Isn't it when Jesus died on the cross, he broke the deceptive power of the devil at that? Yeah. Could that be considered him um, crushing the head of the serpent? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think so. Yeah, fair enough. So now let's come to the, the real meat of this argument. Why did God give circumcision to Abraham and, and, and all his descendants? Do you want to say so? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. We can read the second sentence there. <laughs> In the days of Abraham, and, the many, years after. and many of the surrounding years, there were lots of religions. Mm -hmm. And these, relig kind of these religions had uh, very sexual connotations and very aggressive sexual activity. And uh, with the temple priest, temple prostitutes, etc., involved, and uh, he was trying to make it so that the temple prostitute might say, "Oh, you're one of those, huh?" Mm -hmm. You think that's a, a mark to keep them different? You think I that's the answer? Yeah, yes, I agree with that. But in Paul's day, they still had Diana, and they had yes. And in fact, so. if you look historically, a long time later, it became, it became not very popular to be a Jew, and they tried to uncircumcise themselves. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how they did that, yeah. but they, they well, and, and it, was, it was a challenge because in those days, if you went to a gymnasium to exercise, you did, it naked. you did it naked. So you could just look around the room and tell who was a Jew and who wasn't. So, so that is the reason? That's the That's absolute the best reason? the reason that anyone's ever come up with. Well, what about the flesh? The ways of the flesh versus the way, the spiritual way? You mean, you think circumcision makes a difference in that? Well, what, yeah. What you, what, what's symbolically it does, doesn't it? That's why it's called the ways of the flesh. I, I, exactly. I'm getting over my head here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, these religions, which God made them take away the way of the flesh. He 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 I made think it I more that, difficult. He made it more difficult for them to slip into these pagan fertility cult ceremonies and do do it without being detected. No other nations picked up this. Um, long because, time a long time later, they did because it does have medical advantages. Some. So what did these other religions care about it, whether they were Jewish or not? Well, they're converts. The were, they knew that the Jews were supposed, not supposed to be involved in that kind of stuff. They had their own religion. Well, I know, but these guys are converts to a yeah, pagan they, religion. Look, at these guys are even coming over. See, we got a good deal going. It, would, it, it proves, would, proves we're I, right and they're wrong. <laughs> it would cause the women to look at them as hypocrites and maybe God was shaming them. Know. You know, that you My guess is it didn't matter what the women thought, but it was, they said one thing in one place and another when they wanted what they wanted of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And so they're labeling themselves as uh, the men knew yeah. what well, they were saying outside of the of the temple. There were there were some ceremonies taking place when you were circumcised, wasn't there? Now now let's let's be clear about this. At what point in their lives were they circumcised? Eight, Eight days. days old. Eight days. Did they have any choice in it whatsoever themselves? No. 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 But the parents knew the significance, mm -hmm. and they knew that th they were these babies were dedicated to that kind of life. Yes. So there's all kinds of meaning there. So it isn't just it isn't so just a big flag waving around, hey, I'm supposed to be doing this, but I'm not doing it. Well, but that's part of what it is. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, more I, do you I will want? admit that. Well, I will admit want? that, but there's, I think there's more to it than that. Well, so what, what, it, what was the argument in Paul's day? I mean, over circumcision. Why were they arguing about circumcision? 
Well, the, 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 the people believed that in order to be qualified as a, as, a, as a follower of the Lord, you needed to be circumcised. Certain groups of people believed they, that. that. That's right. There were known as Judaizers. They're the right. people we're talking about. Jews who had come into the Christian faith and somehow missed out on <laughs> something. There. And they must have been in, they were in Paul's day. He's the one that's yeah. talking to them. So you so wonder how they got in there. And here's, here's the story. These people were trying to convince the Galatians. Okay, you got into the Christian church, but if you want to be really in, you need to practice all the Jewish rites. And the ultimate test of that in Paul's day was, are you willing to be circumcised? But why did they want them to practice the Jewish rites? Yeah, that's the question. Because, well, because they, they, the had, they had developed the mindset that their salvation mm -hmm. was dependent on performing this set of rituals. And if they did these rituals properly, they had salvation. It was and nothing that's about what they, salvation. It was about elitism. That's what I think it was. Well, well they had it's nothing all, about salvation. Well, come on. Salvation. They, were not, they were not trying to convince the people, okay, come and join us, we'll be elite. They were trying to convince the people, you have to do this to No, be they came in and said, be like us. We are the elite people yeah, okay. that we need to have. Come join us and be like us. And well, only the elite people have salvation. No, but you see, well, they, realized, they realized when they came back from Babylonian captivity that they had to keep the law. Mm -hmm. And so in order to keep the law, they made rule after rule to keep them farther away from sin so that they would keep the law as a means of salvation. Okay, but you're going a little further than circumcision because God gave them the circumcision. But it's they, not tied really all, they tied all of that together as a ritual that they could partake in and obtain salvation. But I could still divide it up between what man came up with and what God had shown them what to do. But here's the problem. God made all these wonderful promises to Abram way back in the beginning. And they all depended upon Abram having what? son. A son. Where was the son? Nowhere to be seen. Yet to come. Yet to come. How many years are you going to be patient? When you know there's no way you can have a whole generation of people and have kings and your descendants, etc., etc., if you don't even have a son. Well, Abraham, don't you think Abraham was praying every day for this? Sure. But he, had, he, he came to another test where he was going to have to do away with the only son they had that, yeah, that counted. That came later. It came much later, but uh, he was going to, to take the life of that son mm -hmm. and depend on God to do something to make it happen. Mm -hmm. What's well, worse? he just hadn't developed that kind of faith at this point in time. What's worrisome in that in Revelation, God says, here's the patience of the saints. As people who may live through Revelation, what kind of patience and how long are we going to have to have patience when we look at all these people, how they had to go for years and years and years? And you wonder if anyone is able to have that patience. Mm. In the Old Testament, people really didn't. Who has had enough patience? Mm -hmm. Well, but in Revelation, there will at least be 144,000 of them. Yeah, we'll develop <laughs> patience. So those of us are waiting for the Lord to come because He promised and said He would come. You know, we just wait. We don't need to get out and preach. We don't need to get out and send out literature, write books, but or we just wait and, you know, He'll take care of it. The problem is that the difference is this, that you don't have to have a son in order to wait for Jesus to come. Yeah, but you do have to wait for him to come. Well, yeah. And so what can you do to speed it up? Anything? It, well, it, Peter, yeah, we're says, Peter says if you, if, you want, if you need to speed up, you get out there and do something. Well, he well, that, speeded things up. <laughs> he sounds, hasn't come yet. Maybe <laughs> Abraham felt he was going to die before the son was born and he better do something because he was a hundred and what? Or ninety? He was a hundred years old when Isaac was finally born. And you know, the incredible thing is if you read Genesis 17, we don't have time to go back and look at all that now, but in Genesis 17, he already had Ishmael and God came down and says, guess what? 
I'm going to give you a son. Now, Sarah is not having periods anymore. Ishmael was already a teenager. And God says, yeah. I mean, Abraham says, yeah, I, I got Ishmael here. And God says, no. No, there's going to be, Sarah's going to give, I have a baby. And, and, and Abraham just bowed down and started laughing. And a chapter later in Genesis 18, it was Sarah that was laughing. So, of course, they had to name Isaac what? Laughter. That's what Isaac means. And, and, well, and he, God had to have helped her through the whole thing because oh, really? for an older lady to go through a pregnancy, to have a kid, then to take care of a kid, God had to bless her. And he had to take her out that far to have it really be convincing to everybody looking on that it was a miracle, that he was involved in it, that this was not natural. But, and how but, far is he going to have to take us in the future? Same distance. Okay, this is, this is the question now in that light. Does God ever ask us to believe things, anything, that seems completely impossible? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like what? That's Jesus, my question. Jesus is going to come back like well, the plagues. You and still have consistencies. I mean, I don't think God, mm -hmm. does God ever ask you to believe something that's not consistent? Yeah, he gives us enough evidence. And then you asked for an example, the time of trouble. It's going to seem like we're... Well, the, the only thing yes. I can think of mm -hmm. is, is maybe um, the sacrifice of Isaac. Well, it might be before that. It doesn't sound yeah. too consistent. No. Yeah, Before I don't that, even know how he did that. Sarah's long stopped having periods, and you're still waiting for her to have a baby. Does that sound inconsistent? Definitely. Well, what's what's odd is where everybody started laughing. <laughs> Whoever was, you know, Jesus, the Son of God was there. Yeah. The angel or the Son of God was there, and he probably kept serious, didn't laugh at all. And then, why are you laughing? And and then. And what did she do? She lied. She What's said, that? I wasn't laughing. I wasn't laughing she, because she lied that, about it. God says, "Well, well I, I think you were. I think she could tell he was serious. You know, yeah. stop laughing, and then he was trying to be polite. Say, so, no, I didn't so laugh. So, what is in terms of our days? Because we're, we're we're running out of time. But let's think about this serious. This is this is the real crunch here. What is the relationship between faith and having patience, waiting for God? If I understand it right, those who will be translated will be in little caves surrounded by people that want to kill them. And it looks to everybody like they're going to be wiped out. And that's exactly what Satan wants. He, that he, what's what he wants to do. He wants to wipe he them want, out. He wants to have that happen. And it's going to go so far that it looks like he's going to win, mm -hmm. just like Sarah knew that she couldn't, have a baby. she couldn't have a baby. These guys are going to know they're going to die, but they cry out in faith, and they're rewarded, just without, like Sarah was. Well, there's, you know, there's, there's lots of promises in this Bible. We just wait for them to happen, I guess. Without faith, people would be having anxiety attacks, depression, all these mental things that will run physical havoc with your body and with faith the relationship between faith and um, patience is faith allows you to have patience when you run out of faith then your patience is gone you think okay. well, this I, is, don't this is I don't know about that Some, well, somewhere in here you're going to have to get on the ball and do something this is a story for those mm -hmm. at the very last mm -hmm. well, so that they can recognize that God has a uh, a, a miracle you for them. Something. Okay, the Spirit, now we're talking about God's Spirit. Produce, I'm reading Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There's no law against such things as these. Now, self-control. There self -control. may be no law, but uh, people sure don't like you to have those things. How does self-control relate to do-it-yourself religion? You know, I'm asking too many crazy questions. Ab today. Abraham did wait. Mm -hmm. He and did. Finally, Sarah died, and he married again, and he had lots of kids. Yep. So, was that what's supposed to happen? 
You're supposed well, to wait. The story's over by that time. Well, the, but he, the, the woman of promise, the baby of promise is born. The woman of the promise is gone. Well, I know, but part of that promise was to have lots and lots of children. And he did. through these other children, he had, you know, probably a lot more than the descendants of Isaac. So by waiting, you know, he, he well, got all those children, but it was with another woman. Say that question Wait, again. Yeah, what was your question? <laughs> My question? <laughs> My question is the question. <coughs> uh, it actually, it's back up How here. Does self What's the relationship between the self-control that we're supposed to get from the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, supposed to give us, remember Galatians 5.22, the gift of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, I'm sorry, the fruit of the Spirit is all these things including self-control. I don't know any relationship to that unless you tie it to faith somehow. The self-control okay. has to be tied to faith to make it Work. Well, my question was, does, it have any, does that have anything to do with do-it-yourself religion? You just, Which is what we're talking about. Just sit around, and if you don't have self-control, you just wait, and it'll come. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Self-control <laughs> is unselfish, and do-it-yourself religion is a selfish religion where you're serving yourself. Well, yeah. What are some of the first fruits there? Read the list again. Okay, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The, the list, um, let me just read Enjoy right peace. straight from my Good News Bible. But the Spirit produces, this is the fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Okay. The very first one is love. Mm -hmm. If you truly love someone, they may try your patience to the max. Does but that help you have more patience? But self-control gets you through. Huh? That's right. But love, I think, is the number one key. Yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Go back up to verse 14 in chapter 5. It says, for the whole law is fulfilled yeah. in one word. You shall love your yeah. neighbor as yourself. Exactly. Yep. And mm -hmm. You can't reduce it any beyond that. Well, after Ishmael was a teenager, God finally took action. And we've already talked a little bit about that. Clearly, Sarah was past the normal time for childbearing. Isaac was a miraculous baby. Notice that both Abraham and Sarah laughed at God's suggestion that they could have a child of their own. Is that why they named the baby Isaac, the baby Isaac which means laughter? How often are we tempted to rush ahead of God with our own fulfillments of the plans instead of waiting for God? Well, why do we rush ahead? That's when you don't have faith. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you have to have, uh, th there's a lot of things, if you've got everything, mm -hmm. you know, you, you will have patience, mm -hmm. you will do the right thing, if you have everything. And if you've got God, you've got everything, and the reason why you have everything is that you have faith in Him. <laughs> well, several of you have already mentioned the story that happened some 20 years later. And finally, God says to Abraham, okay, get up in the middle of the night. Take your son Isaac, the son of the promise, out to a mountain that's three days journey away and sacrifice him. Now, does that make any sense? And the fact that no Isaac sense. went along with it. Yeah, at the last minute. He didn't even know what was happening yeah. until the last minute. No sense whatsoever. It doesn't seem to make sense from a human perspective. It makes it? the same amount of sense that him having a child with Sarah at their age made yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. And he discovered that when God said something that looked impossible was going to happen, it he said, did. if he could make something out of that, then I'm going to let him do his magic on this one too. Yeah. He had learned to trust God's word. Evidently. I can't help but think that maybe he knew some more things, Abraham, about God, about the situation than we do now. I mean, all we have is what's in the Bible right here. Yeah. Well, we have a little bit more than that. What do you think, uh, now I want us to think in a, bigger, in a bigger setting. What do you think Satan had to say to the onlooking universe as he watched Sarah and Abraham trying to do it themselves. 
Because Abraham was called the friend of God, right? He, he, several times in the Bible, he's called the friend of God. Imagine Satan turning around and said, Do you see this guy down here that God calls his friend? Look what he's doing right now. And then later, he lies about Sarah. Look what he's doing now. Later, he lies about Sarah again. Look what he's doing now. But what's odd about that is he didn't turn the screws. God did. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's the one that took a long time to come to mm -hmm. fill his promise and everything. So why would Satan go around? Well, what did Satan have to say when Abraham's out there with Isaac and said, okay, sorry to say, but God has told me you are the sacrifice. And Isaac said, okay. Satan right, he probably, went all the way to the point where he had the knife raised. Satan probably said, God is not a friend that you would want. Look what's happening. Look, look what's happening. But he had to convince the angels quickly before they saw the result of the sacrifice and realized it was the picture of Jesus. Yeah, but wasn't the issue, isn't the issue about God? I mean, that's what Satan is yeah. doing. If you, if you, and again, we don't have time to do this, but if you happen to have at home a copy of the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, turn to page, the bottom of page 154 and the top of page 155 and read what the universe learned from this whole experience. It's a very interesting few paragraphs. There's about three paragraphs there. Do we have kind of a mini Job experience here? There's a mini Job experience. Would we be able to stand up under that kind of stress? And when you don't have a picture of this larger view, this is a very mysterious story. Yes. Don't understand it. Well, what kind of relationship was God trying to establish with his people at Sinai? Let's look, let's, let's draw some conclusions now. We just have a half a minute left. All of Abraham's descendants were supposed to be circumcised. When they were down in Egyptian captivity, they were not circumcised. God brings them out. He says, we, we need to establish a relationship. The people said, oh yeah, we're used to that. We're slaves. Whatever you'll tell us to do, we'll do. That's what slaves do, right? And they just were ready to promise anything. But God says that's not the way religion is supposed to, to work. Ishmael and Hagar were finally had to be sent out because they, they didn't, they, that was not God's plan. Isaac instead was, the, was a child of promise. And that's really what this two covenants was all about. See you again next week.